On today's episode, we're talking with Zach Winkleman about telemedicine. Stick around. Let's be better athletic trainers. Dr. Zach Winkleman comes to us from uh, South Carolina. He has a PhD in curriculum and instruction with a focus in athletic training. Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Zach, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, as you said, my name is uh, Zach Winkleman. I'm from Houston, Texas originally. I uh, went to school at Texas Lutheran University, uh, which is a small school in, uh, right outside of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, after that, I went to Indiana State for my master's and my PhD um, and worked with the Indiana State men's basketball team while I was a graduate assistant there. Uh, and then during my PhD, I provided healthcare services to uh, the local hospital for outreach services to secondary schools around the area. Um, and now I'm here at University of South Carolina. I'm the clinical education coordinator for our post-professional program. So I oversee about 53 graduate assistant athletic trainers throughout the community and teach within our professional and post-professional programs. That's awesome. Um, so now how did you get in with telemedicine? Sounds like yeah. this would be a good doctoral thesis. <laughs> um, so it was actually during my, uh, my master's uh, program. So during that program, uh, we're located in Terre Haute, Indiana, where Indiana State's at. Our team positions were located in Indianapolis, uh, which is an hour and a half drive. And unfortunately, the graduate assistants at that time were usually responsible for making that commute with the, with the patients. And so uh, it was an hour and a half there, an hour and a half back. And what it turned into was maybe a five minute appointment for some time, just to do a quick check in, range of motion, uh, wound checks after surgery but we literally spent three hours driving in a car for a five minute appointment. And I started thinking about that my first year, like there's gotta be a better way to do this than sitting in a car all day. Cause I missed three hours. It would be their patient care or class, whatever it may have been the same for the patient. Um, and it didn't really click until my second year. Uh, we had, I had two specific patients. So the first one had a Liz Franck injury and required surgery. Uh, everything went well. Uh, he got home though, and his parents were here. Uh, helping take care of him after surgery, and they couldn't figure out how to hook up their cryo cuff, and they FaceTimed me, and I helped them set it all up, and I was like, oh, that was easy. Didn't have to drive over there. Didn't have to, like, figure out how to talk them through it on the phone, but we just FaceTimed and got it all figured out, and then the second one was a patient that had athletic pubalgia surgery in St. Louis. Um, now, St. Louis is about two and a half, three hours from Indiana State, and we had to go six different times for that, that patient to go through pre-op, uh, the actual surgery and then wound checks and return to play and all these appointments that was just a really, really long drive back and forth for a quick wound check. And I was like, all right, seriously, there's got to be a better way to do this. And that's really after I finished my master's that I, I started to explore telemedicine more. And I went through a telehealth facilitator program uh, that's accredited through the American Telemedicine Association and got uh, certified as a telehealth facilitator um, and started doing that in, in my research and teaching. Zach, that's awesome. Um, yeah. it, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I just recently, there, there's a school down the road, Messiah College, that um, they, they kind of do a similar thing where, you know, instead of bringing the doctor to them all the time, they decided that the telemedicine was the, was the route to go. And I thought that was, that was brilliant. So I love, I love the, the thought process there and, and the unique um, way to, to solve that problem. So uh, kudos to you. Um, so let's, let's jump into it though. I, I, I love this. I love that you, the, you're, you're into the telemedicine. Um, it sounds like you, you've, you're well-versed in it. So I, I appreciate you being on the show. Uh, before we, we dive into like the nitty gritty and, and really get into the details of how to do this, uh, can, can you just talk a little bit about the legality of it? Um, you know, what, what has to be in an SOP? You know, I know when I was doing a little bit of research for, for myself here, um, you know, being virtual, um, but not having any students on campus, you know, we're looking into, you know, like each state has a different, you know, policy on this or, or, or different, um, you know, just what, what your, um, the, the legal aspects are of each state. So can you just talk about that and, and what we need to have in place so we can do this legally? Yeah, I think starting with this, this concept in this talk is, is the perfect lead into the information. So telehealth, telemedicine um, are kind of interchangeable terms. Telemedicine is really about the clinical practice of doing like the diagnosis, evaluations, and assessments. So that's the term I'll use most often okay. uh, during the podcast, but you may hear me use telehealth. 
uh, which is just an overarching theme over everything that's done through uh, remote kind of interactions. Um, but when you're doing telemedicine, the biggest thing you got to start with is one, you having liability insurance as the practitioner and making sure that uh, either your liability or malpractice insurance covers telemedicine visits. So yep. start there, look at that. And if not, um, make sure that you get a writer for that additional services that you may be performing. Um, then move in into your state practice act. So um, I've reviewed probably about 30 out of 50 um, state 51 state practice acts for, um, for athletic training. And most don't mention the word telemedicine, telehealth, technology, um, or anything relative to that. So most of the time they're not listed in there. And now it's when they specifically list that it's not part of the services that we gotta be mindful of. So right now, most of our, our states don't state anything about it. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, they're starting to add that in. And I would encourage anybody listening to this, this podcast uh, to really think about adding those things into your state practice acts if you're on some governmental affair committees, things like that. So uh, we can start working towards and being on the same page as PT and OT moving forward. So uh, it kind of explore your state practice act. Most likely there's probably not gonna be much in there though. Um, and then the next part is to make sure your physician's on board. So either uh, have extending orders that state that you're allowed to do telemedicine, um, or if not the whole staff is comfortable doing it, consider a privileging document. So a clinical privileging document see, say, states that the, the collaborating physician has seen you do a telemedicine visit, they're comfortable with your process of doing it, and they've signed off or allow you out of your staff rather than having a standing order that all the clinicians at this clinical site uh, can do it. So if only one or two people want to do it, I would suggest that route rather than a standing orders. Um, and then that way you basically have a sign off that this person, my, my physician is comfortable with me doing it. And they're, they're um, included in that kind of decision making process. Um, so I think those are some of the main starting concepts or places to really look at for that. Yeah, I just want to go back to the to the to the beginning there and just clarify. So if if the if your practice act doesn't have it listed, then we kind of assume we're okay. As long as it doesn't say you can't, then we can. Yeah, and so uh, specifically, unless you're dealing with Medicare or Medicaid patients uh, and billing for your services, the the physical medicine realm, which is OT, PT, AT. Uh, really doesn't have many laws relative to telemedicine. Now, if you're billing for patients for Medicare and Medicaid, the whole game changes. And so there we have what are called state parity laws relative to telemedicine. And that dictates where a person can be when they start a call, uh, where the patient can be, how they can bill, uh, documentation and consent to things that you have to obtain before you can get going. And that's really where the laws start to take place um, relative to that. Now, in our world, we don't really have those restrictions, but we should be following those best practices. And so what I often recommend people to do, um, it's a website called Center for Connected Policy. Uh, it's a really great place to go and check out your specific state's policies on that and start to try to follow what Medicare and Medicaid are doing. I think if we can keep up with um, reimbursement and billing laws and restrictions, we make ourselves even more uh, qualified healthcare providers in the realm of the general public when we start to try to move forward with some of these things in the future. So um, those specific laws state how you can document. So some require you to have uh, written documentation, um, consent, either being verbal or written consent to be able to do the treatment, um, and then making sure you document like the location of the patient, the location you're at, all of those are things that uh, you got to kind of be mindful of if you're billing for these services. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was some of the things that we ran into was um, just making sure that we did have the consent and then, um, you know, just being that we're a college. So we have kids from all over different States, you know, we had to make sure that their state allowed us to do that. Right. So I think that's, that's another piece too. Um, so yeah, that was great. Thanks. That, that's just crazy. All the, all the moving parts, especially with Adam, with your case, I didn't even think about the different States being involved. Um, Cause you always think of, you know, your, your sports team, you're based in the, the state that the, um, that the college or university is in. Um, but yeah, I guess when they go home, they would be considered residents of their state. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're virtual, right? So we, nobody's on campus. And so we have, you know, kids that are located all over the world or we're not over. Well, they are over, yeah. all over the world, but mostly um, continental U United States. But yeah, so we, we had to definitely kind of dig into all the different practice sets and just make sure we were okay. And, and we did, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there were a few States that we didn't feel comfortable with that, that, you know, the rest um, just kind of didn't, didn't feel like their, their laws would, would abide with ours. So we, we just kind of decided not to treat those athletes and, and, and more just kind of guide them to, to more resources in their area. 
Uh, but yeah, definitely stuff to think about. Yeah, cool. Adam, I, I totally agree. I agree there. The the two terms that you're going to look for if you're trying to figure out those laws are originating site and distant site. And okay. so your originating site is usually where the patient's at home or where they're at. Your distant site is usually where the healthcare provider, so the athletic trainer in this situation is at. And so for most of those, you have to be, so for us, if you're for COVID and all these things that are happening right now, some of us may not be in the state that we're actually working in. So I know for um, some places, you know, you may live in New Jersey, but work in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania or wherever and um, drive across borders back and forth. And so if you're not licensed in that state or you're regulated by the state that you're at, but you're in a different state, that's where it gets really complicated with some of these laws. So yep. you've got to be mindful of where you're actually starting your telemedicine calls too. Yeah, no, thank you. That, 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 that hundred uh, percent. So let's let's jump into uh, uh, to some technology issues. Um, so, what platforms and what types of tech do athletic trainers need to be familiar with uh, when we go and start down this route of possibly providing telemedicine to our uh, patients? I think that's a great question. Um, oftentimes, I think people are this is the hesitation that people have that it's like, well, I don't want to learn a new app or I don't want to download this new thing um, or I'll just figure out what the easiest most comfortable way is like I started the conversation with about FaceTime. Now, after learning more about telemedicine, FaceTime is not okay for this at all. So if you take anything away from the podcast, don't do FaceTime for telemedicine. Um, it's not safe. It's not encrypted. doesn't have the virtual privacy networks to be able to do it. Literally anyone can hack it, which if you use FaceTime, just be mindful about what you're using it for at all, because it's just not a safe platform. Um, and with uh, the Office of Civil Rights, who oversees HIPAA and high tech, the two, the two uh, kind of overarching uh, privacy protection policies, uh, they've loosened the guidelines now due to COVID. Yeah. So for this, you can use things that are that have some um, uh, availability, some like somewhat like Zoom. So Zoom has Zoom yep. for healthcare, and then yep. Zoom in general. And so now you can use Zoom, the general uh, one for for telemedicine. Now only why the HIPAA restrictions are relaxed. And so you got to be mindful of what do you do when those HIPAA restrictions are then uh, returned back to where they were at the first place. So things to look for, things that you want to check out. I do need to mention I've had disclosures that I've had grant funding through some of these organizations that I'm going to talk about, but I'm not funded currently through any of them. Um, but doxy.me, I think, is a great uh, platform. It's uh, got a, a free and a paid version. The free version you can use on a desktop or an app-based. And when I implemented this at Indiana State with our team physicians, we had a lot of the doctors that love to do it on their phone and use the app on their phone. And it's very similar to FaceTime once it all starts to connect. And so using that app versus just getting on FaceTime uh, provides you the same security through HIPAA and high tech that we need to look for. Um, so using something like that is great. You also, if you use the paid version, you can customize it with logos. Um, you can do three-way calling, file shares, sending uh, patient education back and forth. Um, you can bill through it too. So there's a lot of great things through, through some of those apps. Um, some of our documentation systems actually have telemedicine built in. So if you've ever heard of Healthy Roster, uh, they have a virtual telemedicine uh, that's built into their app uh, and connects through the FaceTime of the phone through the, the app um, on there. Uh, but it's again, filtering through it rather than using it itself. Now on the most basic version, uh, the main things you need to have are a webcam, uh, that is HD, uh, I would suggest, and then has a good microphone. If you got those two things, um, you, you got something to start with at least. And so making sure that you start with uh, a good webcam and good microphone to make sure you can see the patient and they can see you well too. So now are these companies um, advertising or is there a like a, a HIPAA certification or a way to, to know that um, the, the platform that we're choosing is HIPAA compliant? Because I, I think the worst thing to be would be to pick one um, and then you know misunderstand or it has a different certification or whatever and then get burned on the back end. Yes, so when you're, when you're searching them, um, you wanna find one that's both HIPAA and high tech compliant. So high tech's the new act that came out in 2009 that oversees any electronic PHI, so the protected health information for electronic communication. So with telemedicine, you have to look for stuff that's not just HIPAA, but also high tech. Um, and so on their websites and when you're downloading forms and business associate agreements and all that type of thing uh, to kind of get started, that's where you'll find that those kind of language there. So really looking for those uh, HIPAA and high tech um, distinction there. 
Now, just to um, open up one one little rabbit hole, and, it, and if we don't um, if we don't go down this, that's fine. Um, what what is the standard for the high tech? What what are um, what's the I, I guess the um, the act calling for? So the act basically oversees everything that HIPAA does, um, but with electronic communication. So this was passed when the Affordable Care Act uh, came out and uh, tried to improve preventative efforts and technology implementation. So this really uh, was birthed out of the electronic medical record expansion. And so they said, if we're gonna encourage and basically pay for people to adopt EMRs, we probably need to make sure we have privacy protection laws relative to an EMR. So it really came out of there. But when, it, when that happened, uh, they noticed that you know, technology has changed healthcare uh, drastically, and this now applies to any electronic communication. So anytime you're sending uh, emails, text messages, uh, EMRs, telemedicine, uh, high tech is the act that now applies to that. It's very similar to what HIPAA states and does, though. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. No, that was a good ex explanation. Yeah, no, I appreciate that too. Um, and any other, you know, tech tech things that you would you would encourage? You know, we talked about the basics. Anything like that you find is really helpful that, that, um, you know, I know personally, I, I prefer, um, somebody have a laptop. I feel like the laptop is just a little bit easier to kind of move around. If I'm, if I'm having them, you know, I need to see a different view rather than a phone, unless you have a tripod or something like that. A any tips or tricks like that? Yeah, I think the, uh, the laptop or a tablet are really good ones. Um, I like to have something that is is movable though so i encourage the patient to not be at a desktop computer where they're stuck at it uh, and that's just from over time like doing gait analysis i like to have the patient like hold the tablet and walk with it so i can see how they are or set it up at the bottom of the floor and have them walk back and forth towards that tablet or computer um, and so i found that some of the things like that are make it really useful um, when i did this at indiana state we actually purchased chromebooks uh, for the doctor's offices and our athletic training clinics. And they're super little, they're pretty affordable. They're about 150, 200 bucks. Um, but Google Chrome is the best, if you will, platform to run a lot of the tech off of. And so, um, and so getting those Chromebooks was really helpful in terms of connecting easily to um, programs and things that we were using telemedicine for, but we're also very portable around to other healthcare facilities. So at the college we had five or six athletic training facilities. And so being able to transport those around during busy times or uh, baseball season, we could bring it over there easily, right? It's not just stuck at a site. Yeah. I mean, it, obviously we'll, we, we will be um, all set and ready to go. Right. But I think some of that is, is communicating that to the patient beforehand. So that they're all set, right. Like you don't want to show up and like, like um, Zach said, like if they're on a um, desktop and, and all of a sudden you're like, Hey, I need a different view. And you know, they're, they're crawling around on their desk trying to figure it out. Like not, not a good situation. So yeah, I think, you know, communicating what you want from them before the, the, um, the appointment is, is obviously very important. So Zach, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing those um, tips. But let's move into the assessment. So, you know, we all have our traditional assessments in person. We, we, we know how to, you know, evaluate an injury live. How do we do it virtually? Yeah, so I think the, the this is what my dissertation, all my research has really been on, is how to do orthopedic exams through telemedicine. Um, and there's always hesitations and limitations. And so I want to acknowledge those. And my, my piece of advice as the athletic trainer, not the researcher in me, is that this is a supplement, not a replacement to our care. And so I don't see us turning into robots or things like that. So when I go through this, just know that I'm not trying to rid the profession of our hands-on <laughs> skills. So I get asked that a lot during <laughs> um, presentations and things like that. So I do think there's still value to what we do with our hands. Um, yeah. But there's also things that we can do really well through a virtual platform uh, to still get some of our, our key information. But the biggest thing we got to do is set it up um, to be a safe environment, something you can see well. So working about lighting, um, making sure you can see the patient. Uh, so if you're looking for things like bruising, ecchymosis, swelling, you got to have good lighting in that area. Yeah. Um, making sure that it's free of distraction so the patient can actually focus in on you. Um, those are the key things you got to think about before you get started onto that exam. And then once you get started, it's really uh, hyper-focused on the history taking. And I think what I've noticed in my clinical practice doing telemedicine is that the history taking becomes so much more focused. 
I can't talk over Adam or Phil right now, like at all, not possible to do it. And so in clinical practice, we often are like palpating, doing a Lachman's, asking a history question, doing all these things at once and multitasking, which is, yeah. it, which is great. But in telemedicine, you really have to list, stop, listen, and listen to the patient's response uh, to then move forward. And so I think our history taking skills become so much more uh, helpful to what we're actually doing as practitioners. Um, and so once we get started with the, the history, really focusing on the, the goals of the patient, those things, uh, getting into the assessment is where I think it's the most fun. So um, doing self palpations is one thing that I, I really encourage uh, clinicians to do. So uh, what I encourage the uh, athletic trainer to suggest to the patient is you got to teach them how to palpate first. So making sure that we're avoiding medical jargon, like touch your olecranon process, like they don't know what that is. Um, and making sure that you're really explaining what, how you want them to touch. If a person's in pain, they're probably going to be hesitant to touch that area. So I often use like capillary refill. You don't need to press down too hard to teach kind of a, like a light palpation versus like a pressure point on your thumb area for like a headache pressure point. You got to press pretty hard down into that area to feel it. So I teach the difference between kind of a light, just superficial palpation versus more of a deep palpation to kind of get a uh, criteria for me patient has no idea what the difference and all of that means to them, but it really helps me to understand, um, is it more of a superficial or deep tissue uh, injury that's going on? Um, strength testing is, is a little difficult. There's a great article out by the Mayo Clinic that came out during COVID. I think it was in April or so um, that really went over a lot of the different body parts about how to do strength testing using the stuff in your, in your house or your home. So using a wall to do uh, upper extremity testing, doing more functional type of things like uh, calf raises, toe walks, uh, squats, rather than doing singular manual muscle tests. Um, you can do them against yourself. I don't necessarily know if they're as um, helpful, if you will, yeah. uh, to what you're doing, but definitely the active range of motion, I think, is a great place to start. So start with your active range of motion, figure out what's going on, uh, and then add some more functional testing rather than the resistive range of motion that we're typically been using. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in documentation there, like, you know, we're not, we're not scaling that on a one to five or, you know, a, a typical manual muscle test. Any, any thoughts on that, on, on how do you document that then? Yeah. So the, the strength testing or the functional testing, I, I usually write like within normal limits or able to perform without hesitation or restrictions. Um, now for goniometry, uh, there is some really good ways to integrate multiple technology platforms into there to actually oh, yeah. get quantifiable Darkfish. data. Yeah. So, so using things like um, there's a platform through the NIH called ImageJ where you can upload pictures. So if you take a screenshot and you can upload it, uh, there's apps that are out there that you can have the patient download that app, um, like goniometer apps, and have them place it on their body themselves and move. And then it records a reading for you. Um, and so there's a lot of ways where you could take a screenshot, put the put it on there later and measure it or have yep. the patient download an app and you still really get some good quantifiable data then to measure over time. Um, yeah, for going I, I was going to say that the, you, you mentioned the screenshots and I think that that's something I use very frequently, right? Like just get them in a position, have them go through a range of motion and, and pause. And then you can just very easily take a screenshot of your computer and then you have that on document. And then, like you said, just progressively over time, you can see those pictures, um, you know, and, and see the change. So yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. I think um, with the screenshot, I will note uh, here from my HIPAA side, just another legal aspect. Uh, and if you're, if you're taking the screenshots and you delete them after you've uploaded them, make sure to empty your recycle bin too. Okay. So this happens a lot that people leave them on computers that are shareable networks or things like that. So make sure you've removed it from all those places after you've uploaded them if you're going to do that. Yeah, very, very good point. Very good point. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's something yeah. I, sh I, I need to remember as well. Um, what about actual orthopedic tests, like a Lachman, you know, th sure. those types of more um, hands-on uh, evaluations. What, what do you think about that? So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of them and I think you got to be creative. So okay. they may not be as evidence-based as you want them to be in terms of like the specific uh, testing in terms of the hand placement or what you're trying to do. But my dissertation research was on teaching athletic training students how to do telemedicine for uh, for, in general, and then they had to implement it for an, a patient with an ankle sprain. Um, and so we got to watch them do all these special tests. So they did like tailored tilt tests, really easy to do um, through um, uh, telemedicine. 
a lot of them tried to do like an anterior drawer, explain how the patient do a self anterior drawer. And if you think about some of the stuff we do with like self mobilizations or self manual therapy, they're very similar to the things that we could get a patient to do. Yeah. Now, is it meeting the same exact specifications of the special test or selective tissue test how it was designed? Maybe not, but does it elicit the same response? So say an anterior drawer, you're really testing for laxity, but maybe some of our other tests that test for pain, could you elicit something that would be a painful response? And if so, does that give you the key information that you're still looking for? Um, and so I found that some of these special tests are really easy to do, like a Thessaly's for meniscus it's a much better test than McMurray's and the evidence, and you can easily do it in you know, on telemedicine versus um, uh, like a McMurray's test. It's going to be almost impossible to do on telemedicine. Um, I had my students this semester actually test out some tests that I think people thought you couldn't do. Um, and it was really fun to watch some of their, their creative minds like go forward with it. So like Lachman's, almost everyone would be like, nah, I can't do that. But we had some people like teach their patient on telemedicine to like use a belt um, or use a towel to pull their leg forward um, for like an anterior drawer response um, while they're pressing down or having a weight on their foot. And so really got really creative with, do if I needed to do this test and this is what I really believe in, how could I get someone to do it? And so uh, it just takes some creativity and identifying which tests are easy for someone to self-perform versus the ones that um, like laxity testing that are really hard, like a Sperling's test, almost never gonna be able to do. Um, but doing something like uh, uh, process or the components of like empty can, uh, Gerber's lift offs, things like that, you could you could get someone to do for a shoulder exam and things like that. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. Um, do you, you don't happen to have any of those like recorded on on YouTube somewhere where people could check that out, do you? Um, I'm not sure. That Mayo Clinic <laughs> article does have some a couple. Uh, a couple of the special tests. They do like a modified gains lens uh, and and a couple of special tests that they did okay. in there. Um, I'll have to see if I have any of those recorded yeah. for the class. But, I, th yeah. there, there's there's um, a yeah. business venture, man. Just start yeah. <laughs> uh, start putting out some telemedicine special tests like that. Yeah. That's brilliant. I love that. Um, and, and obviously, like you said, this, the students are, are very um, imaginative and, and can come up with some stuff like that. So I think we could we can all learn from that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So so Zach, you like that that was super helpful. Um, I'm curious. We talked about at the beginning how you you originally you had started the telemedicine with your your orthopedics with your doctors. And I'm assuming that, that you were in the, were you in the visit with the patient and then the doctor is on the telemedicine or it's just the patient? So we did it multiple ways. Um, and so it was really up to the comfort of the, the individual. And so most of the time, uh, my training is a telemedicine facilitator. And so we're, uh, what I did was we served the athletic trainer was with the patient in a room and then they mm -hmm. joined the orthopedic position from a distance. And so yeah. the athletic trainer served as a facilitator. So right. if the physician was like, do a Lachman's test, I was there to perform the Lachman's test or the athletic trainer was. Now, there's also been times where we've done it where the athletic trainer is at the, the one site and the patient's at another. And so they're doing a complete exam just one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, so if, we've done it both ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just curious because I thought that, I think that's a good, again, if you don't have the opportunity or you're two hours away, like you said, you know, you can be in the room with the patient actually doing the assessment for the orthopedic and he can kind of tell you, Hey, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Cause I think that's valuable as well um, in certain situations. So just, I, I yeah. wanted to touch on that. So thanks. Yeah. I think it, I think it improves our, some of our interprofessional collaborations there too. So if mm -hmm. you have a really specially uh, uh, individual that lives in like, for example, for us, what's in St. Louis, it would have been really helpful if we could have been able to do this, that that specific position, there was only like three or four that was trained in that surgery. And so uh, we needed to go to St. Louis, but it would have been great if I could have just done a resisted sit up test in my clinic. And then he watched exactly from St. Louis rather than driving to watch him do it. Um, exactly. So, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of value on that. A lot of value. Cool. So I think we can all agree that, you know, history can get us 90% of the way to a diagnosis and the, the hands-on uh, PE kind of gets us kind of refined as to what we're thinking. But then how are we, how are we going about treating these, these athletes, these patients? Yeah. So I think the, uh, the fun side of this is then what to do next. And so um, I will put a disclaimer out there that I'm not a big fan of modalities. Um, and so I found that it doesn't really affect my, my uh, next steps, if you will. Um, so if you're, a, if you're a fan of manual therapy, uh, exercise, movement as medicine, rehab, 
then I definitely think there is uh, a lot of benefits that you could use telemedicine for. So now I'll introduce a new term. This is telerehabilitation, so telerehab um, in the literature. And so if you're looking for stuff about what to do next, that's the term you'll want to look up. Um, physical therapy is the one that uses this term the most and um, has done a lot of research on comparing it to face-to-face -to -face, uh, exams. Mm -hmm. And what the literature supports and states is that when you're doing telemedicine uh, care versus face-to-face -face care, if you could complement those together, that's when the outcomes were the most effective. And so rather than having a patient come in seven days a week or six days a week to see you, say, come in a couple days a week. The other days, let's do some telemedicine from home and just check in on you about how those are doing. And I think during COVID, what I've seen a lot of my colleagues do is a lot of check-ins, but I would encourage people to be uh, a little bit more proactive with that response and say, let's do a one-on-one -on -one guided rehab session together or a group rehab session for people that have similar, similar pathologies um, and put everyone together on a Zoom call, maybe do some yoga together um, or things like that, that you're trying to put everyone back together as a group and encourage some of that uh, mental health side of this in terms of bringing people together. But from an, also from the rehab side of, I need you to specifically work on these things. Let's work on this one-on-one. -on -one. I can see you do the exercises at home and then modify it. Um, and that's where you get to have fun. So people probably don't have like kettlebells and BOSU balls and stuff laying around their house. So then it turns to, let's do a scavenger hunt of your house to figure out what we can use. So things like pillows, uh, cans of uh, uh, vegetables, things like that, using baskets to add stuff into it and using the basket as things to do weights on um, and things like that. You just got to get really creative about the resources that someone has in their home. Nice. And, and again, similar to, to the previous question um, when we talked about technology, are you, um, are you prepping your patient for that? Or is that happening? Like, are you saying, Hey, do you have a list of these household items? Do you, what you like, what's that pre-process look like? Yeah, so um, what my, I encourage people to do is to, uh, if you know that you're gonna do a specific rehab, um, to send like a, a home exercise program protocol before. Uh, so create some type of like patient education. Most of the telemedicine laws, like if you're billing, you actually have to send written documentation or a, a printable PDF or something like that to the person okay. by email before or after the telemedicine call. And so what I encourage people to do is do it before. And so they are at least a little bit aware of what to expect when you get on the call. And then they're kind of prepped about the exercises. Sometimes we spend so much time just educating the person about how to do the exercise correctly yep. that we lose the time. So sending something before may help to uh, improve that buy-in for that person. Yep. And then with that, you can create some kind of a supply list. So, um, for example, if a patient has like carpal tunnel, uh, maybe you're wanting to do some like finger webs or things like that. So maybe a Play-Doh at home, do you have a large ball or something that you could hold or grab? Uh, maybe it's a, a spoon or a fork or something we could do some resisted things with. And so really trying to get creative about if you don't have that, do you have something similar to that and find what you do have at your house um, and help to kind of guide your, your plan that way. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like it, it's it's really important to have a plan going in, right? Like you don't want to just wing it. Don't just show up to the call and have never thought about this person before. It, it, it probably makes a lot of sense to be very, very well thought out before you get into it. Yeah, and I think that challenges us as athletic trainers. A lot of the times we don't know who's going to walk in. We may have set up appointments and tried it, but you never know who's actually going to show up or who's going to walk in that day. Yep. And so um, with telemedicine, typically – we have to set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment or call for that to happen. Um, when I was doing some research rel relative to telemedicine during COVID, we had some people that said that they were doing like group calls or like an office hour type of thing, like drop-in time. Mm -hmm. uh, but most people were doing one-on-one -on -one calls if they were doing telemedicine. And so that requires you to be ready, reviewing the documentation before, where they were at before, the things you were asking them to work on, and yep. then what are we actually going to spend the time doing today? Um, which I think challenges us as athletic trainers to be more prepared and individualized in our patient care that we're delivering. Yeah, completely so agree. I'd, I'd like to get your opinion on maybe uh, some of the third party applications like the PhysiTrack or uh, MedBridge has um, kind of like a, a rehab side to them. What about incorporating those programs into uh, the, the tele, uh, tele rehab? I think if you can provide videos and things like uh, uh, outside websites, the same as like using the app that I talked about to do goniometry, I love when you can combine tech platforms together. Um, I think it gets people more uh, engaged in what they're doing. 
Um, and so I would encourage it. I say, I think like sending videos of rehab exercises sometimes are helpful. Uh, HEP to go or HEP to go provides a picture, but if you can provide a video or something about what you want them to do, those are really great platforms uh, to really integrate in. Um, and I think it gives people that um, next step of patient education that like, hey, I want you to do X, Y, Z. And they get home like, I only remember why. I think X was supposed to be to do it this way and Z, I don't even remember what that was called. So I'm not gonna do it. And so providing those videos or those helpful tips um, through some of those outside tech websites really does help to bring some, some of those things together for that patient. That's awesome. Yeah, that is. And, and I just wanna go back to something you said earlier about um, having the, the one-on-one in person and then more of the follow-ups uh, telemedicine and, and just more of a statement. Cause I think that was, uh, we, we talked about it, but we kind of then kind of just drove by it. Um, I think that's going to be really valuable even as we move, you know, I don't think in, in the world of COVID, I don't think we're going to be um, back to normal hours, normal athletic training styles for, for uh, you know, hopefully the vaccine comes and, and, and we do in the next year or so, but you know, it might not. And I think that's a great opportunity to, like you said, like kind of, have that one-on-one maybe once a week, but then have the follow-ups um, virtually, which I think could be really, really valuable. And they don't, you know, they don't need to be super long. It could be 15, 20 minutes, just checking in, making sure that they're doing their exercises correctly. Um, so I think that that was something really valuable um, that you, you had mentioned. I just want to kind of circle back and make sure everybody got that. Um, and then I, I, Zach, or did you have something to say about that? Go ahead. Yeah. If you don't mind, um, I think that's where we got to get creative about what the next steps are. And so uh to share kind of our, our research rel relative to COVID, we found a lot of people were starting to use it when COVID first started. And so about 40% of the people that we surveyed had started to use it. But when we followed up in September, most of those people had stopped or not continued it. So they felt that it was like a quick fix to a bad situation. And I'm more of like telemedicine has a purpose. You just have to find how to complement it in your clinical practice. And so uh, what I would encourage back to y'all, if you're struggling with like work-life integration, this is a great way to figure out how to figure out when you can maybe use some of this at home and not spend all day at work. Or if you have long breaks, like winter break that would that's that's happening, uh, spring breaks, things like that, where you don't see a patient for a long time and you need to, great way to integrate it again. And so I think also with um, uh, a lot of our schools here in Columbia, at least, didn't have a fall sports season and they canceled PPEs in March, April, when they typically do them here. And so now they're about to start sports in January for the first time at a lot of our uh, small colleges. And so now they're like, we need to get all these physicals done. How do we get this happen? And so while you need to probably send them to a physician to make that happen, you could use telemedicine to go through a lot of those history taking um, uh, options. And that was something that my mentor, Dr. Games at Indiana State had introduced to me that maybe we could do some of these things that we need to spend more time actually asking people rather than just a yes, no, and dive really into those history taking questions or that PPE history um, and encourage you to maybe try to figure out how you can complement that through telemedicine moving forward um, in your clinical practice too. Completely. I love that. Zach, this, this has been great. This, is, this has been awesome. Before we, before we dive into the lightning round, unless Phil, you have any other questions on the... I'm good. You're good. Um, I'm just curious, resources. Is there, is there like a book out there? Is there, you know, I mean, what are, what are the big, you know, I, I, it doesn't seem like there probably is yet, right? But like, are there any really solid resources that you would absolutely advocate if, if you find one, that'd be great. Send it to me too. Um, <laughs> so Zach, uh, I think you should write it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know about all that. We'll see. Uh, but I think the, the issue that's been specifically to athletic training when I got into this about five, six years ago um, was that there's nothing out there except for stuff on stroke and mental health and dermatology. And that's really like the main areas for telemedicine is a key concept of. And then outside of that for like specific areas, like jails and prisons is really big. Uh, the NASA was really kind of where it started back in the 70s. So there's some really cool stuff out there, but a lot of it's like, how does this apply to sports medicine and athletic training? And so for me, it was, you have to read other stuff, but have an open mind to say, how do I take and integrate that in? Um, but I would say the Center for Connected Policy is a great place to look at for things relative to legal issues. Uh, the American Telemedicine Association um, does some best practice guidelines and documents uh, about what um, some policies and rules and ways to get uh, started on that. Um, but I encourage people to check out places that have uh, telemedicine education programs. So like the program I went through was at Jefferson University in Pennsylvania, actually, 
Um, yeah. And I went through the telehealth facilitator program there. And then I've done follow-up uh, continuing education relative to doing physical exams uh, for uh, gen med and primary care and musculoskeletal. So they offer a lot of resources um, for those places and they're relatively uh, inexpensive, about $100 a course or so. Uh, and so I think it's a good use of some continuing education money, things absolutely. like that, if you have those resources available. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it sounds like they're out there. They're, they're, they're not one big giant one, but they're just, you, you got to find them. You got to go out yeah. and, and actively look for them. So. And they're not advertised to our market. And I think that's where you got to, you got to find something that's out there, but then take it back to say, what do I do with this for, yeah. for my job and my profession? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, all right, Zach. So at the end of this, we always do our, our lightning round. So just, you know, a little bit off topic, but uh, fun for us. So the, these answers can be as long or short as you want. Um, so let's, let's jump in. If, if you're not currently in this role, or if you are, you can, you can say that, but what, what is your dream job? Um, I actually love my job here at University of South Carolina. So um, I, it's, I've only been here two years, um, but it, it's definitely exactly what I was looking for. So I get to teach in both professional and post-professional education. So preparing a clinician and advancing a clinician. Um, and that's exactly what I was looking for. So uh, I think it's here right now. You know, I love the fact that we get that answer more often than we don't, yeah. honestly, like that. And that's great that, you know, we're out, we have these professionals that are out there and they're in love with their job. So I love that. Yeah. So when you're not working your dream job, uh, what do you like to do for fun? <laughs> Um, I love to do like weekend trips and travel, uh, which has been hard during COVID, but I like to go explore like little areas outside of the place I live to like get to know the community. So when I lived in Indiana, um, Terre Haute, it's a great place to would go to school and it was awesome, but getting to go to Chicago and St. Louis and Louisville and all these places around the area um, and get to explore those communities was, was really fun and checking out breweries and wineries and things like that around those areas is, is always a good time. Awesome. Awesome. So a little bit deeper here. What, what inspires you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think being challenged uh, is probably like my, my go-to and I, that inspires me to figure out what the next step is. And so I love when people call me out or figure out or question me on the things that I, I say or suggest or do or teach. Yep. Um, and often, you know, everyone gets upset in that moment, but then I mm -hmm. spend hours being inspired to say like, what else is out there? Or what did I miss? Or how could I have done this differently? And I think that's um, changed me as a healthcare provider and an educator both. So I think being challenged is definitely the, the that one thing. So now what does being an athletic trainer mean to you? Being a, uh, being a healthcare provider first and foremost. So identifying ourselves as a healthcare provider. Um, but to me, it also means being this whole person connected individual that can do and treat and intervene for a lot of things that people need to understand that we're more than sport, um, that we're, we can do a lot of different patient populations. And within that, that patient itself, we can help them with a myriad of, uh, of issues and conditions and illnesses that they may be dealing with that it's more than orthopedics and it's more than sport. Um, and so I think just being more uh, inclusive and open-minded that we're, we're bigger than that. Brilliant. I like that. Brilliant. I like that. Love it. Zach, thank you so much yeah. for coming on. This has been awesome. You absolutely crushed this episode. I, we, we seriously appreciate you being on. Um, if viewers have any questions, um, you know, is there a way that they can reach out to you? Yeah. Um, so I, if you can, I prefer when people reach out on Twitter, I'll respond to you. Uh, cool. So my, my Twitter handle is at Zach Winkleman. You'll probably spell Winkleman wrong, but it's, uh, it, it's out there. So it's W-I-N-K-E-L-M-A-N-N. -N. Um, but you can follow me on Twitter and send me a DM or a question. I uh, post a lot of stuff about telemedicine on there too. So if you, if you want some resources or things like that, feel free to reach out. Perfect. Perfect, Zach. Um, thank you again. And to our viewers, thank you for listening and watching. Uh, until next time, I'm Adam Richmond. And I'm Philip Hensler. And this is the Pats Podcast.